A very good day to all our viewers, both within and outside the country. It's a pleasure being on your screen again to bring you a very interesting program, Insurance Matters. Now, this is a platform where we do our best to see to it that the insurance sector in Nigeria is developed and that we get to where we ought to be per time. This program is being brought to you by Transparent Protection Limited by Guarantee, an NGO that has carved a niche for itself in issues related to insurance and um, uh, the stakeholders, policyholders, and everything around it. My name is Godswill Egede, your regular host on this program, and we'll continue to give kudos to NICOM for their massive support for which we have remained on your screen till this time, and also to Intech Partners, uh, legal consultants that have always been on ground to help us whenever we need them to do one thing or the other. Like we always do on this program, and today will not be an exception, we shall be looking at a very topical issue one of those things that you need to understand before you take on any policy, any insurance policy. Now I'm talking about how insurance principles affect your insurance policies. You will get to know what these um, principles are and how they relate to the policies. What is the relationship? Why do you need to know them? This and many more, my guests will be helping me to demystify um, on this show this day. And so, permit me to introduce my guest to you, one who has been in the practice for uh, a whole lot of um, years now. He has practiced both locally and um, internationally. I'm talking about um, the person of Mr. Shobuyi Ayodeji. You are welcome to this program. Thank you very Mr. much. It's good to be here. Now, I'm sure that the, the, the topic sounds a bit unusual. How insurance principles affect your insurance policies. First of all, I would like you to let us in. What are the relevant principles that every insurer needs to know? Thank you very much. And once again, it's um, nice to be here. I uh, must commend the organizers and the um, supporters and sponsors of this program. This is a great um, platform that I believe will further, you know, create awareness about insurance. Now, back to your question, um, the principle of insurance, it's a great um, topic to be, to be tackled, mm. you know, and I really appreciate the organizers for that. Just like I tell people, mm. um, permit me to digress a bit. Um, if you look at economics or accountancy, it has its principles. Certainly. Even if you look at religion, mm. in Christianity, you hear the Ten Commandments. Mm. Of course, in Islam, you hear the articles of faith and pillars of um, faith, you know. So there's always a principle behind everything. So insurance is not a different um, ball game. Insurance to add its principle. And without um, understanding this principle, the truth of the matter is you would not know when you'll be going ultra virus of the policy terms and condition. That's why most times people will tell you, oh, insurance looks so vague. We barely understand what is um, what we were buying. But I tell people, in as much as you understand the basic principle of insurance, so many things come handy because insurance cannot operate outside these principles. For, of course, um, some theoretical books we will tell you there are seven principles. Some will say there are six principles. But for me, I like to go with the seventh one because it's more encompassing. Brother, right. Exactly, it's brother, so you, you never can go wrong. So we'll be taking this principle one after the other and we'll be looking at how it affects policy. Um, the truth of the matter is when it comes to general insurance business now, mm. these several principles are highly applicable. Now, we'll start with number one, which is the utmost good faith. Okay. The number one, which is utmost good faith. I'm going to, tell, I'm going to list it out, mm. then maybe do damage to it, do justice, mm. sorry, not damage, <laughs> do justice to it one after the other. You have the utmost good faith, mm. you have the um, insurable interest, which is an, you have indemnity, which is the third. We also have contribution. We have subrogation. We also have proximate costs. And lastly, we have mitigation of loss. I can take that again. One, we have um, utmost good faith. Mm -hmm. Secondly, we have the insurable interest. Third, we have indemnity. Fourth, we have contribution. 
fifth, we have um, proximate cause. Six, we have um, subrogation. And seven, for me, I call it mitigation of loss. Mm. And I'm going to take it one after mm. the other. All right. Now, before you purchase any insurance um, policy, it's assumed that you know everything about that risk you are about to um, insure. Of course, the insurer is not a magician. So he or she cannot know what the risk is all about. So there is a duty on you to um, disclose every information as regards that risk you are about to insure. For example, you want to insure your house. It is for you to tell the insurer, look, my house is built with these so -so 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 bricks, is, is located at this um, location, is close to a river in case of flood. Are you there? It is, um, I do store petroleum products in my building. Mm. You need to disclose all that. That is what we call utmost good faith. Now, I must quickly chip in that the duty of um, utmost good faith is not only on the insured. Okay. It also lies with the insurer. Mm. No, for, for example, an insurer should tell the insurer that, okay, based on what you've told me, mm. this is what, this is, um, what we'll be covering. Hence, that's why you see most insurers, they will send you a specimen policy. That is if you don't have a broker interfacing on your behalf. Either. So they send you a specimen policy. Once they do that, they are fulfilling their own duty of what? Utmost good faith. So they are disclosing that, look, this is what we will be insuring you for. These are the terms on condition. Then if you are okay, they move you know, on. Now, the duty of utmost good faith is very, very important. Um, fortunately and unfortunately, if I can use that word, it's always it's an implied condition. You, it's an implied, that is, is a condition that must be met before the contract itself starts. So sometimes you might not see it in a policy. So it's expected that once you are approaching an insurance company, you are disclosing everything and anything regarding that, um, that risk. That is for utmost utmost um, good faith. Are you there? So yes. utmost good faith is divided into two caveats. There's the duty of disclosure and of course the duty um, of um, representation. That's um, on utmost good faith. All right. Uh, okay, so, so quickly maybe touch, um, though I'll, I'll be very particular with some of the um, principle, what principles, is the, yeah. uh, but maybe take on one more. Okay, okay. I'll quickly, for the sake of time, I'll yes. quickly just um, touch it one of them, just bit right. so that the audience can be well guided. So the, the second one I mentioned was insurable interest. For yes. anything you want to insure, you must have insurable interest on that thing. Now, what do we buy insur insurable interest? You must, you must be recognized okay. by law as either being the owner of that thing or having the rightful custody of that thing before you can insure it. Mm -hmm. For example, quote unquote, the usual example I like to use, a thief who steals a, a wristwatch you know, cannot insure it years after because he or she is not the rightful owner of that. So for insurable interest, you must be um, the rightful owner of that thing you're about to insure mm -hmm. or have the right of custody of such thing before you can insure. Okay. Without that, there's no insur insurance right. either. So, um, the indemnity, you mentioned. Yes, indemnity simply means, yes, it's the basis of insurance generally. When we talk about general insurance, indemnity simply means we are returning you to the exact position you were before the loss occurred. Now, we, we always clamor insurance is not there for you to make profit. Mm -hmm. So, what insurance does is that once there is a claim, you are indemnified to the exact position you were before the loss. That's why if an individual buys a car, for example, mm -hmm. and um, say six months after the car is stolen or totally damaged, total loss, now the insurance is not going to give you a new car, no. It's going to give you, it's likely going to give you a car or an amount, less depreciation. You understand? Because you have used it for six months. So mm -hmm. by doing that, they have returned you to the exact position you were before the loss. So that's indemnity. All right. Um, you, you, you mentioned about seven of them. Exactly. And um, for, for the purpose of breaking it down for our viewers to understand, th there are two that I would like you to pay close attention to. And that is, um, you mentioned proximate cause. Yes. And, um, okay, L let us be in on proximate cause. Proximate cause to me means, um, I'll try to keep it as simple as I can so that I don't um, bore the audience with some of this um, professional grammar. So, proximate cause simply means the actual cause, you know, um, the actual cause of the loss. That's what proximate cause is all centered about mm. or is centered on. For example, most times, 
maybe because um, the technicality of some policies mm. sometimes insured mistake happenings for what is actually insured. Give for example, if you have a fire policy, a fire policy might tell you we will not cover fire resulting from say non-domestic boilers. Mm. Non-domestic boiler. Now, to a layman, mm. once he sees fire, he's going to say, there's mm. fire, come and pay. Mm. The policy will be said, no, the, 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 the policy you took was just for domestic boiler. Now, a layman would not understand. A layman would say, oh, insurance have come. Most of them in this part of the world, like, they don't want to pay claim. Mm. So the proxy bay court looks at the, the, the dominant cause of the accident itself. Now, that dominant cause is now checked in view of the policy. If that is what the policy is mm. signed off to cover, the policy automatically activates and pays the claim. Now, if the policy is not, you know, signed off for that um, cover, mm. automatically the claim is going to be repudiated. You understand? It, it, this sounds mm. very interesting. So, so it's not enough for someone to say, I have um, fire policy, and so whenever there is fire, irrespective no. of what. So, no. so does it mean this proximate cause is usually clearly stated in the policy document is it usually the case most wh when you are taking a policy yes the policy shows the boundary it shows what um, is covered in that policy mm. so what is telling that whatever is causing a loss should mm. be by what we have al outlined in this policy and that's why i tell people if you are not using a broker you should endeavor to read your policy documents or most times with um, most times in my practice I usually tell my people in that I consult for at times, always call for a specimen policy so you understand the nitty gritty of the policy you are about to buy. Remember, insurance is a promise, mm -hmm. is, is an intangible commodity. Mm -hmm. So most times, the proximate cause is usually evidence in the policy um, in the form of what is covered and what is not. So are you there? So mm -hmm. if, if um, for example, there's a, um, you have a theft policy mm -hmm. and there was a, a, um, a loss by theft, two thefts in your house. Mm. Automatically, that policy is going, is going to what? activate and pay mm. because it says I am covering what? Theft. Okay. And the proximate cost, the cost of that loss is by what? Is by theft. Yes. Automatically, the policy pays. But now imagine you have a fire policy. Mm. You, you get and there was a theft. Mm. Automatically, your fire policy cannot mm. come and pay because the proximate cost is not true. Um, um, fire, you you understand. So 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 what you you have a covering for fire, and then you you have theft incident, and after the theft incident, this maybe this hoodlum set the house on fire. What happens? Is it not like two in one? How do you differentiate that kind okay, of Okay, now situation? wow, that is a very good one. Now you said something. There was mm. a burglary case, right? Mm. And the hoodlum set the um, um, place on fire. Yes. Now, if the individual has just a burglary policy, mm. the policy will only pay for the damage resulting from the theft or burglary of the woodlums either mm. the fire angle is not taken care of because you don't have a policy mm. for that but if you have a policy for that automatically the two policies activate either because that that fire mm. you understand uh, all right um thank you so much you have really you are, you are going deep it's like um, a lecture <laughs> our phone lines will be on the screen do well to call us probably you have a question that you need to be clarified on, or you have a contribution to make, or you have a situation on ground, like we, are, we always say, beyond the, the discussion we are having here, if you have any claim whatsoever, this is part of the reason why TPL is in existence, you can call us, and then we'll take it up from there. Now, I want to ask, don't you think the, the insurance company should owe the intending policy hold a duty of care to invite this person and explain all these things rather than just sending the specimen uh, uh, document you are so right but i i think i know for sure that's why we have insurance brokers okay some people now go through their insurance broker to save them this um stress quote unquote mm -hmm. you know uh, of having to read the policy one-on-one -on -one. but I've, I've seen people that will tell you mm -hmm. look i want to see what's in my policy mm -hmm. i don't want to go through a broker i want to interface with the insurance company directly so most times what we, um, the insurance company just do is they send them the policy specimen but most times most times it's it's, it's the duty of the broker you know to now take the, po the the policy that they feel is best for the client digest it for the client and you know probably explain you could imagine some companies have thousands of clients between you and you and it might be so impossible to invite 
all of them and start explaining these policies one after the other. And I guess that's why they say in law, mm -hmm. ignorance is not an excuse. You must always try to read some of these things. <laughs> well, yeah. if, 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 if the company can find time to attend to one, to, to sell policy to 1,000 subscribers, they should also look for a way to explain to them, no matter their number. Well, <laughs> it's interesting. Yeah, yeah. You but, mentioned but, subrogation. Yes. We will we'll, we'll go deep into that. You'll throw more light on that. But that will be when we are back from um, this commercial. I, I'd like you to sit back Immediately we are back from this commercial, we'll dig deep into another policy and then begin to look at how these policies affect your, how these um, principles affect the insurance policies. Stay tuned. Okay, um, uh, um, sorry for that. Oh, our, our commercials couldn't come on, and then um, so we'll just continue from there. So, the, pr the principle of um, subrogation, can you let us in on it? Okay, um, you know, I said, um, of course, insurance is um, centered on the concept of indemnity. That is, you cannot um, profit from your loss. Mm. We are to um, return you to the exact position you were before the loss. Now, subrogation. It's um, a, a principle that allows the insurer mm. to pay the insured for the claim and also recover the amount paid from the negligent third party. Mm. So subrogation always arises when there is a negligent third party. Take, for example, in, a, in an um, environment where you have two uh, collision, mm. say motor collision, mm -hmm. one it's A, it's B. Now imagine A has a third party insurance. Mm. B as a comprehensive insurance. Are you there? So the policy B will pay the client okay. for the damage to the car. Now the policy B will now go to policy A and ask, okay, can I have your third party insurance, which is like the common or the um, um, compulsory one in mm -hmm. the country? Can we have that? Then they subrogate against the um, policy A insurance company. Are you there? Just to mitigate their own loss. Now look at this, look at this scenario. Let's assume that um, there was no, there was no um, insurance for policy A. Mm. It's just a, an ordinary man without insur insurance. Now, it's possible, as we have seen sometimes, that insurance pay policy B, and the insured policy B tries to go and recover again mm. from policy A. So it's trying to gain in two ways. In two ways. So most times, and that is, it's very, very wrong. Okay. And at the end of the day, he or she will have gotten more than he or she has what lost and that in this one is moral hazard so most times that principle tend to guide against that so once the insurance company has paid the the, the insured mm. they automatically have the right to subrogate against the negligent third party so automatically the insured no more has the right or have the right to go to the um, negligent third party or the insured can decide to of course collect from the negligent third party and not you know, um, from the insurance company, but you can't take from the two of them. Two, That's okay, the way I, I, I'll be asking a very practical question on this, but yes. before I ask that question, can you let us know how does these principles, how do they affect insurance policies? Why, can you, how do they affect the policy? What, what, what should our viewers be gaining from these policy okay. holders? Thank you very much. You know, um, we started with utmost good faith. Yes. We started with, um, um, insurable interest. Now, this too affects insurance. For example, if you are about to take a policy mm. and you don't disclose everything or you lie, at claim stage, it is the, the insurance company has the right to repudiate your claim because you have lied at the initial stage. You have breached that fundamental principle. Now, when this happens, people will just tell you, insurance company, don't want to pay our claim. They will not tell you they have held on their own part, quote unquote, maybe mm. under utmost good, good faith. Are you there? Yeah. So, based on that, if that utmost good faith, for, for example, is breached, mm. it can affect, oh no, no, not it can, it will affect the policy in itself. Take, for, for example, at claim stage two, as we do see, mm. at claim stage, you are not to lie about the claim. You see people trying to probably add some other things that were not damaged. Mm. Now, at that stage, you are also bridging. 
your duty of utmost good faith at claim stage. Now, if that is discovered, the insurance company has a right to repudiate your claim ab initio. Mm. Just for a line. Not, so you, you could see. Mm. So, but most times, people don't know those things. And when the insurance company writes that we are not paying, they don't go out there saying, oh, they lied. They will say the insurance company mm. is not paying or their broker didn't do his or her job. All right. Thank you so very much for this deep insights on this subject matter. You know, I said I'm going to ask a very practical question. Now, someone is, is um, driving on the, on the road and he has this third party and um, maybe he runs into someone and um, the person he ran into is settled by the uh, insurance company you know, that, that is insurance company has provided the third policy cover. Now, this person who was injured, who sustained injury, if he goes back again to recover from the owner of that third party policy, how do you track that? How, how does insurance policy get to know? The insurance company get to know? Okay, sorry, we have a call. Let's see if we can take this. Hello, your name and where are you calling from? Hello, can we... All right, your name is what? Okay, go ahead. Yes. Thank you. Thank you so very much for, for that call. Uh, well, th that is part of the reason why we are here on this program. I, I will advise you, uh, our address is on the screen. We are, we are interested in, in getting into the root of that matter. If you can come with the documents, then we'll follow it up. If you can trace our office, the, the address is on the screen, or call us after this program, and then we'll, we'll look into it. We're interested in that matter. Thank you so much for calling. I'm back to you, my guest. Time is no longer on our side. Um, before I'll let you go, uh, like I asked, what happens when someone gains from both ends? He gains from the insurance company and gains from the hold of the third party in the, in the scenario I, 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 I painted. Well, sometimes in systems, you can't totally eradicate leakages, if I can put it that way. You yeah. can only try to mitigate it. Um, such things do happen. Mm. That's the honest truth. And sometimes what insurance companies do that um, to mitigate that is sometimes they tell you, okay, go and um, recover from that third party. Okay. But most times, clients see that, insurers see that as being stressful. Mm. Because when you ask them, okay, they should recover from the um, insurance company of the third party, it's like, you know, you asking them to go mm. all out, you know. So that's one thing insurance companies do at times. They, they owe their payments and ask you, just go and subrogate from the other party. So that um, avoids the, it prevents the situation where um, an individual mm. gains on two sides. Mm. But mostly, I must be honest, mostly mm. because insurance company to try to put human face mm. on um, the business relationship, they pay, they pay the insured, they pay the, um, they pay the insured and collect the details of the negligent third party. Okay. They collect the details. So from there they can follow up. From there they can investigate. From there they can know if the insured is trying to play a fast one. But of course they will ask you for the um, details of that third party. Now there are sometimes that the insured will say, oh, I don't have the details of the third party. Now mm. this is what insurance companies sometimes do. Okay. They penalize you. Mm. They penalize you well, for, for, the, for that. So it's, I need, it's yeah. because we are running out of time. I would have practically asked to know how that penalty comes. Maybe next time we'll, we'll begin to look into that area. More details. I, I must appreciate you for your time and um, your insight on this subject matter. Uh, like I said when we started, this program is being brought to you by Transparent Protection Limited by Guarantee with strong support from NICOM and their Intech partners. And we like you to save this number 
that is on your screen. You can call us at any time if you have any issue related to insurance, like the caller that just called. After now, we are going to follow up and request for necessary documents and then see how, I mean, who takes off a policy should be able to benefit from it. Even if it's not there, the dependent should be able to benefit from it. So once again, I want to appreciate you for uh, being with us on this program. Uh, by this time next week, we'll be back on your screen again with a very interesting topic. My guest has been uh, an economist and a certified insurance practitioner who has practiced both locally and internationally uh, for decades, Mr. Shogui Ayodeji. Thank you so Thank much you for coming much. on the it's program. Pleasure. Pleasure. And I'm sure when next we call you, you'll be happy to, Gladly. to, to be here. Thank you All right. Um, as we sign out, my name is Godfrey Nigedi. And from me to you is be insured and be assured of health.